And I'm Keon. And this is Inevitable, that podcast where if you're a suspect, you're guilty. Because this week, we watched Anvil. Written once again by Bill Gallagher. Directed to no one's surprise by Nick Horan. And aired on November 16th, 2009. This is so it. Obvious, yeah, we're finally touching on. We're finally drawing from. We're finally playing into the greatest Prisoner episode of all time, Hammer into Anvil. I should have known you would say something like that when five minutes before we started recording, you went, all right, let me just remind myself what Hammer into Anvil was about because I don't remember anything about it. I should have known. It's because you were going to call it the greatest Prisoner episode. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Dance of the Dead. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Fallout. <laughs> I forgot Dance of the Dead even existed until you mentioned it the second. Wow. Wow. That's the true greatest. But it is, it's like, I'm looking at the episode list now, and they are drawing from, like, just these, the Schizoid Man. So, that, okay, the three the three episodes we have upcoming are Darling, Schizoid, and Checkmate. Schizoid Man was a great episode. I agree. It's highly memorable. I really enjoyed it. Do not forsake me, oh my darling, and checkmate. It's just like, okay. There's even a weird, like, Schizo Man reference sort of in this one, because the only, like, the only person whose name we learn in this episode who isn't a number is named Curtis, which, if you'll remember, the name of the guy who plays Six's Schizoid is Curtis. Right, and in this series, number two is Curtis. Yep. This episode also, um, and it's it's kind of weird in that way, because it introduces like lore aspects, you know, which is something the original show was never really concerned with, to its benefit, I think. Right. But I mean, what I appreciate about this one, what I appreciate is that they confirm that there have been other number twos. Mm -hmm. So it is kind of like the original, but, you know, yet maybe it's like this number two is actually competent and whatever he's supposed to be doing, I guess, being a public servant, as they say in the episode. So, yeah, I don't know. (laughs) Like the other number twos in the original show were getting outed because they were because they failed most of the time. But yeah. Yeah, those failures. Yeah, I still have that shot in my head of the um, the number two from A, B, and C just, like, looking at the phone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Worried that this that his time has come. Yeah, and that's something to be said for the original show where it has these m- extremely memorable shots. Like, I can pick, still picture certain shots from the show in my head. Mm-hmm. This series, I don't think, even comes close. Right. But again... I don't think it's... It's not bad. Like, it's not bad. No, I don't think it's bad. I also think that this show is doing something a lot more interesting with the music as opposed to the visuals, which I'm going to talk about later because I did a little little bit of a dive into uh, a piece of music that appears in this episode. What I found will blow your mind. I'm just a click... I'm clickbait headline now. (laughs) (laughs) Five things you didn't know you wanted to know about Prisoner music. Yeah, I actually wanted to talk about the music as well. Mine's a very minor thing, though. Which I guess I can... I mean, we're talking about... I'll just bring it up now, is that the the composer for this series is Rupert Gregson Williams, who's like a fairly big Hollywood composer. Yeah, he and does a lot of, of movies. The brother of Harry Gregson Williams, who's also mm-hmm. like a fairly big Hollywood yep. composer. Yep. Yep. I think Harry did... Uh, Harry Gregson Williams did uh, Aquaman. I think he's done like if you look at both Harry and Rupert's credits they just like every single thing they've composed is extremely famous well known and widespread (laughs) Harry Gregson William Harry Gregs Harry Gregson Williams also did he also did Shrek (laughs) shoot cancelled inevitables cancelled that was Harry though not Rupert they're related. <laughs> yeah. 
we can't have anything to do with Shrek, even the slightest connection. Nope. Nope. Cancelled. Absolutely done. It's gone. <laughs> Off. We're skipping straight to the next season. We're doing Lex. Okay. This episode's over. We'll meet you next week for Lex episode one. Yeah. The prisoner has betrayed us, including Shrek adjacent content in its <laughs> in itself. <laughs> We thought this was, we thought we'd be safe. We thought the Prisoners 2009 was a bastion against Shrek. We were wrong. You're right. I wonder if Rupert even talks to Harry anymore. I mean, I wouldn't. You did Shrek. How dare you? I mean, there's the obvious thing that we're not mentioning and that I'm not going to actually say. I'll just hint at here, but, you know, there's that obvious thing. Dylan knows what I'm talking about, but you as a listener probably don't. I'm going to save my music-related thing till the end because it involves a piece of music that gets played at the end that, with the context, is a little more interesting to talk about. Yeah, no, I didn't think we would go on a massive tangent against Shrek. I just wanted to bring up that, like, this was done by Rupert Gregson Williams. And, he, I mean, it's a good score. I really enjoy it. No, yeah, I mean, the one piece that I'm a little eh on is the title theme music, which is a little dull. Yeah, it's just pretty much yeah. boring. Uh, but the rest of the music's pretty good. The rest of the music's pretty good. Yeah, this is like the one TV show where it's like the the title intro theme is like meh, but the the rest of it is like yeah, yeah, this is pretty good. <laughs> Usually it's the other way around. Yeah, exactly. So episode opens, and I was really curious to see where this episode was going to open because last week ended with six being pulled into the hospital screaming, "I am six! I am six!" And this episode kind of just opens with him, like, dumped on a dock. And he wakes up and he's like, what the hell? And uh, and a guy in a tow truck, number 909, or not a tow truck, just a truck, drives up, 909, and he says, well, what do they call you? And he goes, uh, well, they call me Six. Right, and they're sort of on the outskirts of the village. Which is interesting. This village yeah. is a lot larger than, than the Port Marion village. Right. Yeah, because, right. I mean, in the original Prisoner, we had those shots, you know, you just, you'd pan over the entire village and it was, it wasn't that large, or at least what we were seeing of it. And then this one is like, you don't really have that capability, I guess, because it's much bigger. Mm-hmm. The, this village seems like it's a lot hev- more heavily populated than the other village in, in the original mm-hmm. Before we get anything else with Six, we get something interesting. I mean, I guess it's just interesting in the fact that it comes before really anything else in the episode, which is that 313 has been having weird dreams and she's been making drawings now. Yeah, and this kind of leads into something that gets introduced in this episode or given a name, which is that people who dream of the outside world are called dreamers and they're sort of like an underground resistance group almost. Yeah, and I think that's that's kind of what we learn now because nine oh nine takes six somewhere. He just tell he doesn't tell him where, but he just he takes him somewhere, and lo and behold, it's it's to number two playing golf. Right. And number two basically reveals that uh, nine oh nine is an undercover, is what they call them. Yeah, I think they also and call them like six to They join. also call them cells, I think, as in like. Well, so it's it's. 909 explains this actually when he, uh, when they get in the car in a second but undercovers are the names of the individual people like each person is an undercover and they work in cells that are composed of two to four people yeah so obviously not riffing on because this is exactly what it is but obviously like you know like splinter cell or like terrorist cell or something like that right yeah which is usually I mean I don't know I was going to say it's usually given to like to uh, sort of rogue groups or something like that. Again, like Splinter Cell or Terrorist Cell or something, but like maybe it's not. I don't know. I think Cell just means some group of people. Yeah. (laughs) It also means those like microscopic 
things that everything's made of or that, you know, organic things are made of. Well, yes. Well, well yes. <laughs> Maybe there's something to do with that in the episode. I don't think so, but could be. <laughs> Gonna go with no. <laughs> anyway, they're having this truck drive on the way back because their um, assignment is to investigate this guy in 1955. And 909 says that their job is to not get in the way of any of the other agents who might be investigating him because they don't know who, they don't know if there are other agents. And if there are, they don't know who they are. And they're not supposed to even ask. And they don't know. And Six goes is like, well, if we don't know, then like, couldn't anybody be investigating anybody? 909 is like, yeah, couldn't we all be yeah, undercover? 909 is like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> He's just like, well, I don't like to think about that, basically. <laughs> Do we learn that? 1955 is um, maybe associated with the dreamers and that's why they're going after him in this scene or is that like just insinuated later i can't even remember i believe it's mentioned here yeah so the dreamers you find out mostly via context i don't think they ever actually explain it because again every explanatory scene was cut out <laughs> in the deleted scenes <laughs> Um, there's this coalition, yeah, of people called the Dreamers, who we kind of already knew about, and they have these dreams of wor the, the world outside the village. Yeah. Yeah. They're dreaming of a world outside the village, unaware that, it, that, that that is... Well, actually, wait, no, hang on, maybe the world doesn't exist. Maybe in this universe only the village exists, I don't know. Yeah, we don't know yet. And this is the episode, this is really the turning point. It's We're already halfway through the show, but now, you know, the path ahead is mostly clear, which is that Six is probably going to be seeking out the Dreamers and and going from there. But then again, I wouldn't put it past the show to just throw us for a loop there. To just not do that? Yeah. <laughs> Surprise. So... Number six is basically going undercover as a teacher in a school because 1955 is a teacher in the school. Six, actually, when he's talking with two, is like, like, am I like not not a good choice for this? Because it, like <laughs> I'm wor actively working against you. And two's like, and that's exactly why you'd be perfect for this choice. Yeah. Uh, number six is given the task of teaching surveillance techniques. And he's like, isn't it weird we're teaching surveillance techniques to kids? And 1955 just like sidesteps the part of the question that's like to kids and just goes, well, it is your specialty, isn't it? <laughs> it seems like number six is having like a different job in every episode. Last week he was a truck driver. Now he's a teacher. Right. Which is interesting. His methods seem a little outdated, though. When he's in class later on, one of the <laughs> kids just pulls out, like, this big, um, uh, I don't know, microphone or something. Yeah. Uh, but we, so number six gets kind of a primer on teaching at the school and watches 1955's class, which is a history class, I believe. And they're basically going over the history of the, of the number twos. Uh, so they ask, like, which two oversaw the Reformation, which, like, what is the Reformation? What does that even mean? Uh, apparently it was two the 14th. Mm -hmm. I wonder which uh, two this one is. We never really learn. We never learn. Probably more than 14, I guess. They also ask, like, who was the first lady, like, who was the first woman to? And someone just responds, like, lady number two. <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> Uh, but the most interesting part of this scene to me was was six asks, well, who is number one? And a thousand one hundred uh, gets picked to answer, and she gives this answer that there is no number one. That the title of number two as the leader of the village uh, reinforces the concept of humility because there is no number one who is an absolute power of the village. It's always number two who feels subservient because they're not numbered number one. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. is an interesting kind of thought. Yeah, again, I mean, that's a way you could even take the ending of the original show is that, like, there is number one is, like, society itself or something like that. I don't know. But, like, right. here, then, here <laughs> that's more heavily codified into the actual world of the story. 
Yeah, and even still, we don't even know if it's ki- this kid's telling the truth or not. I mean, 1955 says, yes, yes, very good. But like, maybe that's just the truth that the village is pushing upon the kids. Like, we see pretty explicitly that the school, it's never stated, but it's it's heavily implied through all of this that it is a sort of propaganda machine for the kids. Right. This is this school scene is also where something came together for me that I hadn't, I'd noticed it until now, but I'd, I'd it was always kind of in the back of my mind, which is that like a lot of the people in the village, the village is maybe multinational, but they're obviously speaking English, I guess, or they're supposed mm-hmm. to be. But then like a lot of the characters are American, yet the things that we're seeing are British, like the, the, the cars are, are, you know, left side of the road driving cars with the steering wheel, you know, on the right. The school is, you know, it looks British. They're all wearing those uniforms and stuff. So. Right. Yeah. Which isn't to say there aren't British people in the show, obviously, number two, 313. But it's just like, yeah, it's this multinational place, yet it seems to be kind of based on, uh, yeah, Britain. Yeah, and I think that's a little more evident in this show because things like automobiles and technology are so present now because we have so much of it in uh, society in the village of 1963, 7. Uh, there's no cars. I mean, there are those little buggies, mm-hmm. those little buggies they drive around in, but there's no clear delineation on the road on which side they need to drive. It's very culture agnostic in that way yeah and i i forget which episode it's in but they even mentioned that of like we're creating this like uh, i forget exactly what he says but it's one of the one of the it's leo mckern's number two it must be in chimes of big ben where he goes like we're we're a new society for for the global age or something along those lines it wasn't exactly that Mm -hmm. but like yeah and plus it's like Patrick McGowan was a British spy from Britain. Or number the number six, not Patrick McGowan. Again, it's like, what's the difference, right? <laughs> Again, the lines blur. Yeah, number, so the original number six was a British spy from Britain. So you, I mean, even, I don't know if people tend to have this perception, but like, for me, even though obviously you don't know where the village is uh, in the show, you don't really know where it's supposed to be even, but it's like, to me, it was like, all right, it's, in Britain until the th- until it throws you for a loop, kind of. But like for this one, number six is American, so maybe it sticks out a little more that he's going to this more British society. Yeah, I mean, even in the original, it could still be in Britain. Does they give multiple conflicting locations for the village in different episodes, depending which one you decide to believe? Yeah, I mean, he fl- they fly to like the that island off the coast of Spain or whatever, and then just like drop him into the village there. So, like, I guess there's one there. But there's a, <laughs> I don't know. There's also, like, Chimes of Big Ben, though. Like, the geography of their escape wouldn't work from that island in that episode, which implies that it's it might actually be in, like, Poland, I think, is where they said mm-hmm. in that episode. So Yeah, I mean, who knows? It could be multiple different ones. It could just be... I mean, it's it just... It just the show literally just throws that question at you and then never answers it. So there just is no way to know, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which again, this show, I just kind of want to reiterate, doesn't seem like it's doing that. This one is still heavily hinting. They're like, all right, there's going to be some explanation to all of this at the end. Maybe there won't be. Maybe that's this version of the prisoner's version of like messing with you. Yeah, it does feel very, I mean, it feels very much to me like the village is some sort of microcosm of something else and everybody in the village doesn't know about the existence outside the village and that, that that's going to come into play somehow in the end. Um, do I know how? I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I guess we'll see. Anyway, I think they do some more surveillance of, of 1955 now. They kind of spy on him and they have like, they have this conversation that's like, it's it's like it's somewhat humorous in that they're like they're look, they're just looking he's just swimming he's just doing laps in a pool and they're like only someone only uh, what do they say they're like only a man who doesn't want to go home after school would come here and swim laps and like no that's like what and like that's the conclusion you draw from this 
I mean, that's the so the, like that that's the conclusion that nine hundred nine draws because six doesn't draw that conclusion, and that's I think just indicative of like how nine hundred nine has been an undercover for God knows how long, and so his thinking has been so warped into like the only explanation he can think of is related to his work, which is that he must be hiding something right. and he doesn't want to go home. And um, this ties into my next note, which happens right about now ish. Uh, I think six says it is. They say, well, everything is suspicious if you look at it properly. Mm -hmm. Even the village. I mean, number six is obviously looking at the village through a lens of suspicion. Maybe he just needs to chill. Maybe he just needs to relax. Maybe he just needs to settle in and become one of the village people. Young man. Yeah. There's a, I don't actually know the first line of that song. Um, (laughs) Oops. Neither do I. I don't know any of the lines except... YMCA. <laughs> that's, the, that's not even a line. It's just a word. It's just an acronym. That's all I know from it, though. So Six now gives his first uh, lesson, and he has all the kids bring in surveillance equipment, and he's learning a lot. You know, we have one of the kids explain to us this little fiber optic camera. You drill a hole into a wall, and you can feed the camera through, and to see everything six furiously taking notes i mean actually though <laughs> yeah and, uh 1100 i think was her name is the one who has that big microphone <laughs> well then six decides to just employ child labor because he's like here's your next task I want you all to investigate the people who run this village <laughs> find out what they want and you know this just goes to show you how awful it is job six really is because lo and behold they just figure everything out within the next five minutes no no i'm just kidding we wish (laughs) six meets with 313 and she's like look i have to stop seeing you because you're just like a weirdo six like like man like this just cannot continue but she does reveal that she's been having dreams and that she's been drawing images. I mean, I think part of the reason she says for not meeting him is because she's drawing images now. Yeah, yeah no, no, those, yeah, those were related, you know, topics. Maybe I explained those in the wrong order, but they were. There was a cause and effect going on there for sure. <laughs> So the kids go off to do his bidding and we never hear the result of that for the entire episode, except in a deleted scene. Yeah, and again, that's it's a scene that it's a scene whose outcome is is discussed and implied in this in the episode that in the non deleted rest of the episode. Yet the explain the, the bit of explanation is cut. Which yeah. seems to be the trend here is like they just went through. They're like, "All right, we shot this thing. Now let's go through and remove anything that makes anything about what's going on clear." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the the deleted scenes for this week were very much of the kind of delete them to make the episode less informative, yeah, or to make to make it more mysterious or something. And it's like it's going to be hard, I think, going forward to not have those deleted scenes be the foundation for what's going on in my mind, at least in my mind. But, um, (laughs) because it's like, those are where we're getting this information that seems to be actually what the rest of the episode is going for. It just never tells you that, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think that's fine though, as long as they're self consistent, because like you said, it's what the rest of the episode implies the scenes that are deleted just say it outright so it's it does just confirm that whatever the episode is implying is what the story is going for yeah but but at the same time maybe not right because like you know those are deleted so maybe the story goes in a completely other direction maybe you know who knows sure i mean we'll know in three weeks because like We'll know very soon. Yeah, because as we're getting all of this, we also are getting more flashbacks between Six and Lucy. And Lucy, I can't remember if she revealed this last week, but she more explicitly reveals that she worked for Simcor 
higher up than number six. And that and you mean some whatever. core. And yeah, some was it? I thought it was Syncore. It's it's S U M M O K O R. Oh. Wow. Well, okay then. Got that from the official show uh page on AMC. Heck yeah. <laughs> wow, I'm surprised they still have that up. Uh, it's they but they had a really interesting behind the scenes video for this episode that I didn't end up finishing before we started recording, huh. unfortunately. <laughs> but I'll link it in the show notes. Well anyway, they decide to go spy on nineteen fifty five in the comfort of his own home. <laughs> and from the comfort of on his roof for them. Right. And nine oh nine and six have a conversation while they're up there and nine oh nine basically says, Yeah, once you're a suspect, you're uh, you're guilty. And then he sends six to go get uh, some coffee out of the car. Of course, six when he gets there decides to investigate nine oh nine's like surveillance notebook. Right, and he has information on six. He has information on three thirteen, and six is realizing that he has been, I guess, tasked at least in the past, if not still currently, with surveilling them. Right. The way they're spying on 1955 is also what the kids said in class, which is that they're drilling. They drill this hole in his roof and stick a little camera through it. Yep. And uh, he's he's asleep for a little while. This all happens concurrently with a scene where two is also being spied on by someone we don't know who. Yet. And still maybe don't. <laughs> I mean, I have a theory... Okay, I mean, I just had a thought of like, yeah, that's probably what it is. I wouldn't call it a theory because there's no like, I don't know. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We'll get there. We'll see. So he's he's being watched. Both him and 1955 notice the cameras watching them. And they're like, well. Two just kind of like laughs. 1955 decides to sit down and slit his throat. Yeah, 1955 decides to just kill himself. Uh, for, 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 I don't want to say good reason, but the reason why uh, presents itself at the end of the episode. Yeah, or, you know, ostensibly the reason. Well, I mean, I don't know, working in that, that, uh, Hole seems <laughs> seems kind of kind of really bad. Yeah, that was like a sapphire and steel ish. Like, let's introduce, you know, something right at the end here. Yeah. So six is like, we have to take him to the hospital. Nine and nine's like, well, it's not our job. What he does is his business. And they're like, no, we're taking him to the hospital. So they just, they basically just <laughs> dump him on the front yeah. of the, the front steps of the hospital <laughs> and yeah, leave. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's at this point where Six is like, hmm, hmm, I better, uh, what is it, what is he? He doesn't, at this point, doesn't he see 909 meeting 1112 in, like, the club or whatever? He does, but we've skipped over the scene where 2 says to 1112, like, I know, I know you've got something going on and that you, like, don't trust me. I'm pretty sure yeah, it's just I think, six. I think it's like eleven, twelve is like he's like sleeping, and then when he wakes up, he goes like, you know, other kids don't have as good a relationship with their parents as we do, or as I do. But no, I don't trust or like I don't know, I don't remember. That's it. Okay, that's this is what we're skipping. Six doesn't immediately go to see eleven twelve. He goes to see two. He gets invited to see two at the golf course alone. Right again. Mm-hmm. And two is like, oh, you're doing a pretty good job. And six is like, shouldn't we wait for 909 to arrive? And he's like, no. And six is like, ah, you want me to surveil 909, don't you? And he's like, yep, exactly. And that's why six even goes to the club because he's trailing 909 and then he sees him there with 1112. Yeah, which is obviously a little, a little suspicious. And meanwhile, 909, because he's also been surveilling six, asks 1112. Um, whether he's been meeting with six at um, at well at bars because that's where we saw him before, 
But it's yeah. just like, yeah, I guess in the deleted scenes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's actually what 1112 says, breaking the fourth wall. There. No, no, no. That would be wild. <laughs> Can you imagine if the show did that? I'd be like, hang on, whoa. In the last episode, like, number six doesn't understand what's going on, and we're, we as the audience are left in the dark, and number two just turns to the camera and is like, well, if you would watch the deleted scenes. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, the point is that 909 knows that 1112 was meeting 6, and 6 now knows that 909 is meeting 1112, and it's insinuated here that they're lovers or something because they do have that intimate moment, but then it's made more clear later on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's never even explicitly confirmed, but it is pretty heavily indicated that uh, this is this is a relationship of a romantic nature. Yeah, which is weird in itself because, like, 1112 isn't 1112 supposed to be like a teenager like yeah 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 maybe that's All part right. of the reason why it's illicit yeah yeah that would probably be part of it so six uh, i think this is the point where after the club six uh, breaks into 313's house to find out what she's hiding from him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He and finds he sees all the drawings of sheep. He right, right. Is this when he? Is this when he sees one thousand one hundred spying on him? In or the deleted that... scene. Yeah. Well, in the deleted scene, but in in the actual episode, she is spying on him. He just doesn't catch her. Or we don't see the result of it. You know, I don't know. <laughs> That's the thing is like the deleted scenes paint this in like, all right, what did he actually catch her and we didn't see that? Or did he not find her or like what, you know? Because he goes after her in the actual episode. Mm-hmm. We just don't see the outcome of it. Don't know. <laughs> yeah. Beats the hell out of me. And there's not as much, you know, online. I, I would have expected, you know, for the original show, if stuff like this had happened, people would just have written, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of, like, words about, like, you know, what actually happened here. But no, this series wasn't really as popular or beloved, so nobody really cares. Yeah, because so many of the people who are watching this are ones who enjoyed the original, so they're watching it because they had an attachment to the original and yeah, they're probably less inclined to write 50,000 word theses on The Prisoner 2009. Yeah. True enough. Number two tells um, 1112 that he knows what's going on between him and 909. We're also yeah. totally skipping the part where number two's wife wakes up. I'm pretty sure that happened a long time ago. Oh, yeah, it did. It did. That was the biggest shock for me in this episode of like, whoa, I thought she was going to be in a, in, you know, her catatonic state, her coma, whatever the heck it was until the very end. I thought her waking up was going to be like this big deal, but it's really not. Right. She, she wakes up and number two has a conversation with her that implies that she's like been in a coma for like years. Yeah. He tells her she's in the village, which she seems a bit surprised about. Mm-hmm. But it also seems like she knows what the village is. Or at least she doesn't ask, so maybe she's just not very inquisitive. Who knows? Mm, the village. <laughs> she's like, ah, yes, the village. I remember when we built that place. <laughs> the audience is like, wait, what? <laughs> you mean the village where explains plot of the show? <laughs> you mean the village where, like... Doesn't explain the plot of Prisoner 2009, explains the plot of Prisoner 1967. (laughs) She seems like she's going to be a bigger uh, influence next episode, I assume, because she doesn't really do much in this episode. And in fact, after the scene where she wakes up, we don't see her again. No, and in fact, there's a deleted scene where she, it doesn't reveal much, but yeah, the only other scene with her was deleted. (laughs) (laughs) Is that who two was talking to in that episode, in that scene? I was a little uncertain if he was talking to her or someone else, because she didn't look like her to me. Yeah. And I had absolutely no conception of where in the episode that scene would have gone. No, no, neither did I. But, like, yeah, I'm, like, 99% sure that was her. It looked like her, so. Didn't look like her to me. 
Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> We've seen so little of her on the actual show. Like, mm-hmm. Well, Eleven Twelve decides to take matters into his own hands. And by take matters into his own hands, I mean take a knife into his own hands, go out to 909's place, and stab him to death. Right. Six six arrives on scene. Well, he arrives on scene at three thirteen's house to see three thirteen get taken away uh, because six. God, I can't believe we skipped this too. Six basically tells eleven twelve and nine o nine when he sees them together in nine o nine's house. He's like, if if you can keep three thirteen safe, eleven twelve, I won't tell your dad about this. Uh, of course, the dad finds out anyway. 313 gets captured. Six arrives on scene after 909 has been killed. And then again blackmails 1112. He's like, I need you to get me into wherever you sent 313 to break her out. Otherwise, I'm telling your dad that you killed 909. Right. Which 909 seemed to accept his death as well. Which was odd, I guess. But 909 was kind of an odd character anyway. Just had a really odd personality. And that is like a, you know, it's, we talk about the original being based perhaps on the castle or whatever, but that is like a Kafka-esque moment where like someone arrives to kill you and you're just like, all right, please, like, yes, make sure you do it properly. (laughs) (laughs) Do it properly. Yeah. That's even the end of, um, the end of the trial is like the main character gets brought out outside the town and he hands his murder he hands his killers the knife that they use to kill him with hmm. the, with what appears to be the full knowledge that they are about to stab him to death I mean I would hope he has the full knowledge they're gonna stab him to death like if he's giving them the, his knife he's like here you go <laughs> yeah alright so the episode now takes a wild turn into just like into just Trance-like WTF. like state. Yeah, no, so we talked about this show being like a dream before, but we didn't even know. We did not even know. <laughs> because, all right, this was actually, I believe this was hinted at in like one line of dialogue, the minds. But. No, it was, it was, it wasn't a line of dialogue. It was a full on scene that we skipped with the ch- taxi owner playing in the yard oh, with his daughter right. and seeing a giant hole in oh, the ground. Yeah, yeah. And he just goes like, what the hell is, I think they're in the park or something, aren't they? And they're just. Yeah, they're like, what the hell is that? I guess they just don't concern themselves with it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we only see. Four seven is it four seventeen? I think one forty seven. One forty seven. I had the right numbers in the wrong order. One forty seven is just sees the hole and keeps his daughter away and is like, "Huh, oh, yeah. weird." Again, that's like that seems similar to when six asks three thirteen about the explosions and she's like, she's just like, "Yeah, it sometimes just happens." Where it's like they're not very. Yeah, again, speaking of people not being inquisitive, they're not very inquisitive about the stuff that happens in the village. Yep. But they've kind of been we see this with the kids they're kind of their curiosity is stifled when they're in school mm-hmm. for better or worse right in this case probably for better since what is actually down the hole is like a I don't even know how to begin to describe it it's like a forced labor camp but but dreamlike, I, I just, I don't know. I can't even, I don't have words to describe it. Rover is patrolling the, um, just the mine shafts. There are people down there who are, look like they're working towards something, but also just look very lethargic and de-energized. Those are the same thing, but whatever. Right. We see some shots of six finding 313. It happens fast, too. It's like, all right, we need to go find 313, and then they just do. (laughs) Yeah, these cuts are really fast. There's a lot of information to process and break down here. Uh, I had a joke note that was like, is this the Rover cult? Is this the new new prisoner's version of the Rover cult? Because you see a bunch of people just walking, like, in towards Rover, but then it's weird because the Rover CG, like, a big ball evolves 
and changes into like the light at the end of the corridor that they're walking towards. And the whole thing is just like LSD acid trip based. It's just wild. Actually, right before it starts, too, we skip this. Um, right before it starts, we have a flashback to Lucy. And she asks him again, why did you resign? Like, why did you leave Summer Core? And then we launch into this whole big wild uh, sequence. Mm-hmm. And then that, I, th- I believe, if I remember correctly, the... The, I don't want to say dream sequence because this whole show is like a dream sequence, but like the more dreamlike sequence of the minds, co- uh, the end of that coincides with the flashback where he tells Lucy to just get out or something like that. Right. So this during all of this scene, uh, a, a vocal piece of music is playing. And that piece is the song Heroes and Villains by the Beach Boys. And last week we talked about. Uh, now I'm forgetting the name of the person who who brought it up. Let me actually just I have the page open. It was that person on Live Journal, a site that I hadn't heard, I hadn't remembered even, I didn't even remember existed. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, Jason Bloom brought up uh, the song "Smile" from the Smile album. Uh, And the use of the water theme from that song last week with an episode focused around uh, escape, specifically over water. Well, the song Heroes and Villains, can you guess what album that was also meant to be on? Because if you guessed Smile, you're right. It's another song from the Smile album. Mm -hmm. And uh, and let me just read to you the, the lyrics of the first verse of this song. Okay. I've been in this town so long. That back in the city, I've been taken for lost and gone, and unknown for a long, long time. Fell in love years ago with an innocent girl from the Spanish and Indian home of the heroes and villains. If that just doesn't describe six in this to a T, except for the whole Spanish and Indian bit, like that's a little eh. Yeah, that doesn't really, but yeah, I mean, the rest does, I guess. I mean, we don't know if he's been forgotten at home. He seems to sort of live this empty and uh, isolated existence from what we're seeing in the flashbacks, right? So, Mm -hmm. But there's this whole weird thing around this show that it seems to be around the Smile album, which I did a little more digging into uh, out of curiosity. And and that album, a lot of it came about while... Uh, apparently Brian Wilson part of the reason he had difficulty finishing it was because he was like on hallucinogenics at the time it was taking hallucinogenics Mm -hmm. and the song Heroes and Villains people from that era Brian Wilson himself included uh, state that to some extent this song which was supposed to be the centerpiece of the Smile album was an attempt by Brian Wilson to capture auditory hallucinations he was experiencing. Mm -hmm. And that the song is designed to mimic the kind of hallucinations, mimic the sound of the hallucinations he was hearing. And that's why like after the first verse or the second verse, there's not a lot of vocals, but there is like humming and distorted voices and just weird things going on, which can, which are in the episode. But the fact that it's all based around like hallucinations and an attempt to, capture a a hallucination in a recorded form or to recreate a hallucination he was having it's just it's so interesting that that piece of music was paired with this scene in this episode and that it was also from the smile album and also according to pop apostle i didn't see myself you can see a copy of the beach boys pet sounds album on six's table in his apartment when he's meeting with Lucy when, before he gets taken to the village. Pet Sounds is the album the Beach Boys released right before starting work on Smile. Like, <laughs> there's a weird connection with the Beach Boys and the Smile album in particular with this show. Yeah, could even play into, like, the dream thing where it's like, yeah, I don't, I'm, I've never experienced it, but a lot of people, you know especially a lot of people who experience sleep paralysis like will have auditory hallucinations <laughs> mm-hmm. so who knows 
And also just like this song apparently was the song that basically broke Brian Wilson from working on Smile because it was supposed to be the centerpiece. He worked on dozens of versions, you know, from two minutes up to eight minutes. There's a version allegedly that's 12 minutes long. Every version is basically different. He tweaked everything every day and like spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in in 2019 dollars just recording this one song to perfection Mm -hmm. and like just driving himself mad repeating the same thing over and over and over again which the parallels to six attempting escape over and over and over again like do not need to be uh or like so obvious but it's mm-hmm. very interesting the the choices that are being made with this uh vocal licensed music in the show and i'm very curious to see if more smile pieces are going to appear in the other three episodes or not yeah definitely So it's very weird that it would appear in two episodes in a row. And that alone already is like, huh, interesting. (laughs) And the fact that he has their other album at his his apartment. Like, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty big red flag. (laughs) I will say that that first verse that ends with, you know, that says, I fell in love with an innocent girl, dot, 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 of, you know, from the dot, 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 home of the heroes and villains. I will just say I've had one thing spoiled for me about Lucy thanks to IMDb credits. That relates to that? Yes. Hmm. Hmm. Um, and and I'll, I'll bring that back up nearer to the end of the show. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we're drawing pretty near. Three more weeks. Yeah, so I'll bring... We'll return to this. Dylan's smile talk will return... <laughs> I also found out that Brian Wilson, like, there are two quote unquote finished versions of Smile, which is also really interesting in and of itself because there's the Smile sessions. Well, first there's Smiley Smile, which was the Beach Boys without Brian Wilson releasing basically what they had as an album. Then there was the Smile sessions, which the the original Beach Boys basically put together. Um, from the recordings put together as many finished pieces as possible and then a bunch of like alternate cuts and outtakes etc and then there's brian wilson prevent presents smile which is when brian wilson went solo found another (laughs) band and then they were like hey do you want to finish smile he's like dude that project almost killed me exactly and then they were like but do you want to finish it do you want to finish it and he and then he eventually was like yeah let's finish it so there's like the Brian Wilson presents Smile and then there's the Smile Sessions, both of which have like complete versions of the Smile songs, but that are slightly different. Like the Heroes and Villains version on the Smile Sessions and on the album Smiley Smile are 336. The version Brian Wilson records for Brian Wilson presents Smile is 440, I think. Huh. Yeah, I don't. those numbers don't seem to coincide with anything in the show, but it would be interesting if they did. Weren't the Beach Boys were American, mm-hmm. right? So and yeah. weren't they the? I don't know too much about them, obviously, but like the narrative I are the narrative I always heard about the Beach Boys is that they were like they played second fiddle to the Beatles, and they always wanted to, you know, outdo the Beatles, but they basically never did in popularity, even though they were massively popular themselves. So maybe that's like that's something meta to do with this show. Rich is like, all right, we're now doing this American co-production, and we're gonna beat the British, you know, show at like. And we're going to do it like this way or something. I don't know. There might be an element of that. I mean, the Beach Boys were huge in their own right. I don't know. I think I think the second fiddle thing is a very much like looking back on it with with hindsight. Mm-hmm. Like people remember the right. Beatles more. And I mean, it's interesting you bring that up because the Smile album was like spurred on by the existence of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely right. Hearts Club Band, which was like... That was the Beatles' very experimental tone poem, throw everything at the wall, do whatever the hell we want album to create something completely unorthodox and weird. And then Brian Wilson was basically, he made pet sounds and he's like, I want to go further. Plus the Beatles just released this very experimental album. We can do that and go even further with it and we can do Smile. And then obviously that falls mm-hmm. apart. But it's it's all very interesting and weird and i'm not sure what the show is is trying to say using all of this but i but there are a lot of themes and parallels between the smile album and like what six is going through in the village in this episode and in this mini series yeah i mean definitely 
There's still a little yeah. bit more in the episode, though. Not too much, but it just it sort of ends. Right. Number two figures out, at least he thinks, that 1,100 is the one who is spying on him. But then they have a little discussion about that where 909 is also present. And it just cracks the question right back open. That's how mm-hmm. I interpreted it. I might have been wrong there. So at this point, I was already fully just like in this dream state. Again, this show just like puts you in this weird like, yeah, it's as if you're watching a dream. It's hard to parse. It's hard to know what's going to happen. It's hard to know what is happening. But my interpretation of it was that like when they actually meet two, 1100 and 909, the the question arises again of who it actually was. But it seems to be 1100 because the eye hole is at her eye level. So, Or any other kid, she says. <laughs> well, Tooth, I think, sent, thinks it's 1,100 because he sent it to the yeah. mines. Oh, he, there's, I, there's perhaps something interesting in him telling her that she can finish her ice cream and then us seeing immediately that, that he didn't follow through on that at all. Mm-hmm. Because she drops the ice cream cone and she's dragged into the car. Was that supposed to be a flashback? Because that does, that happens after the mines, which is they have that conversation. I think so, I think, because she doesn't six find her in the mines. Yeah, and then I thought maybe she like she then had the conversation with two, but yeah, maybe it was supposed to be a, a flashback, or it's like yeah, maybe I guess it's that it's you don't know, like you're just you're in this weird like world you're in this village and like time doesn't make any sense and you don't know what's a flashback and what's not and it is it's just like this dream yeah the chronology of it is unclear which is very interesting mm-hmm. which and is what some- the original show was doing kind of oh uh, yeah on on a larger scale because mm-hmm. the original show was aired not on chronologically out of chronological order a chronology whatever and this one is kind of playing with like you don't know when it's a flashback and when it's not and it's like they're even i mean it's even dreamlike when you think of things like um god what was it it was like oh my god it was i forget what it was it was either 909 or 1955 is getting taken oh my god i wish i remembered what this was but it's like you see someone being taken away and but then it's actually 313 like it's a totally different scene it's a totally different person than what you think it is i don't remember i wish i wrote it down it's like a you really mean when th- 313 gets taken to the mines yeah no but it's like it's right before that it's like you think it's the same scene but it's not it's like the scene right before that you think just goes into that i don't know how to explain it i wish i did but I'll, I'll never. I'm gonna rewatch the episode to to clarify. So I don't, don't know. remember what you're talking about. So can't help you, unfortunately. But on the chronology thing, actually, I just was reading one of my notes that I wanted to talk about. So I'll mention it here while we're talking about it. But like when when eleven twelve is stabbing nine oh nine, the like the way the whole scene is cut together is really interesting because it cuts between him stabbing him and him leaving. So mm-hmm. those almost happen simultaneously because it cuts between the two during the whole event, which is yeah, really is. interesting. Yeah, and it's, I mean, right there, it's showing you that, like, look, this show, it's very, it's clearly showing you that this show is, like, not showing you things always in chronological order. So it's precedent for thinking that, you know, it's precedent for, like, getting lost in this mire of what's a flashback and what's not. I remember what it was now. It was that right after 909 gets stabbed, you see an ambulance taking someone away, and it's not nine. It's not nine oh nine. It's three thirteen. Oh, yeah. So it is when three thirteen gets taken away. Yeah. So it's like, and that's something that like, maybe we're leaning too heavily into the dream angle, but maybe not because dreamers is a big thing in this show, and people seeing things in dreams and stuff. But it's like that stuff. That's something that hap- would happen in a dream. Like someone gets stabbed, and then the person who's getting taken away to the hospital is not that person, you know? Like, it's some, you know, they just morph into someone else all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. Which isn't, obviously, 909 just doesn't morph into 313, but it kind of has that vibe of, like, you don't really... It's just one scene going into another type thing. I don't know. It's I'm really enjoying it. That's, <laughs> like, I'm really enjoying this show and kind of what it's doing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think... 
my favorite thing that it's done so far is just still even the question of like, is all this even happening? I mean, from the first moment we see Six, you know, from the first moment of the show, Six is dehydrated in a desert and like all of a sudden randomly a guy just shows up like getting shot at by the village. Like what are the odds? You know, how much of this actually happened or how much of this is Six Mm -hmm. dying on the sands? How much of even all of this is happening just in his head while he's still back in his apartment with Lucy? Like, we don't know. I mean, is is any of the Lucy stuff even real? Again, no indication that it is, no indication that it isn't, but. Yeah, that discussion he has with 313 in the dinner is is pretty interesting because she goes she her retort to him is basically that like look like people in the village like we just live out our lives here and like you know we're whatever what we're told is like is what we know and like you know people just they just live normal lives and they and then they die like just just like everyone else Mm -hmm. and it just it really just makes you think like you know what if there was someone like number six in real life who who came to you and was like look like the world is so much bigger than you understand like the universe as you know isn't like there's something outside of that and you just be like what 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 the hell are you talking about man like you know you wouldn't know you would you just totally not deny it right yeah (laughs) yeah yeah and it's like you know you even think of like your theory of the original show which is that each new episode was a different like loop in a time loop and number six was just yeah he was caught in this time loop every um every episode of this show opens with him waking up in the sands so like is he in a new iteration of the world you know is he in is he like 50 layers deep in an an inception dream or something like (laughs) i mean there is like Oh god, that's that's actually really interesting now that now that you bring that up because even though this show feels like it's continuous, it feels like it's telling one continuous story. There is there is actually if you think about it, nothing really contiguous between the episodes. There's not really I mean, his relationship with 313 is the one the one thing that carries on between episodes because none of the other characters mentioned the previous episodes 147 did in harmony kind of mention arrival but if you think about it nothing else carries over i think maybe it's maybe like him meeting with 11 12 in in the club because 909 that was a deleted scene remember yeah but it was implied to have been happening like that's the thing is like how do we go to because the show implies what we see in deleted scenes happens without ever saying it so maybe that's why it's deleted i don't know it's too confusing (laughs) (laughs) maybe that's like maybe they were you know just as brian wilson was trying to recreate auditory hallucinations maybe they're trying to recreate the the thing of a dream where it's like you forget as time goes on it's like it gets more unclear like the more you kind of, the more you think about it, the more you try and put yourself into that dream and make it make sense, the the less clear it is. Yeah, I mean that's when you're trying to lucid dream. The more you try to grab hold of the dream, the more it slips through your fingers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Lu- hmm, Lucy, lucid. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, which was a, a, a song whose initials are LSD. Yeah. Although the Beatles vehemently deny that the song is about LSD. Yeah, it's about l- litzed Lucy in the Sky, or litzed would I don't know. Was that song on Sergeant Pepper? I don't think. Oh, it was. That song was on Sergeant Pepper. Wow, that's weird. Lest we forget. I guess the original show did end with not end end, but near its end, it threw in that Beatles song. All you need is love as hundreds, dozens or perhaps hundreds or dozens of people were murdered. Also devastatingly, I am the one was actually on magical mystery tour having my Beatles fan card revoked. (laughs) Well, do we want to detail the deleted scenes? I mean, I feel like we kind of did throughout the episode, but maybe we just go through one by one. 
Yeah, the first one is just an extended version of the first flashback with Lucy. We don't really get anything, any more information, except that I think that actually the information that she worked for Summer Corps is only in the deleted scene and not... I think that's the... I think that's the part they actually cut from the main episode. Yeah, yeah um, it's just it, it's implied in her interactions with him, but it's outright stated in the, in the deleted scene. Uh, the the second scene, so we're presented four scenes: uh, scene three dash five, three dash six, three dash fifty nine, and three dash sixty six. And three dash five and three dash fifty nine are just extended versions of scenes that are already in the episode that don't really provide any new information. 59 especially. Um, 3 6 is the one where 2 is talking to, I guess this is his wife. I'm pre- I was pretty sure. But she was. seems like way catatonic. And like that's why I don't know where it would appear in the episode. Because it's clearly not after, after she wakes up because she's full on catatonic. Is it before? Did he take her for walks like in, in the greenhouse? Like, I have I, a I lot of questions. Af- I thought it was after she woke up because I thought that was her, like, you know, getting better or something. No, but she's full on catatonic. Like they've put spittle on her mouth, dripping from her mouth. There's no brain function. Kind in, in the of deleted thing. scene, I thought yeah. the deleted scene was him in the garden with her, talking to her. Yeah, in the garden, she's in a chair, a wheelchair, completely unresponsive. Oh, I didn't, I didn't realize. Two even, that. I think, makes mention of this yeah. in his talk. He's like, you don't even. Yeah, I guess you can't oh, even respond. Like she's completely unresponsive, that. which is why I don't <laughs> think it was after she huh. woke up. Yeah, I guess it was before then. Yeah, weird scene. Weird scene. 66 is also a weird scene. Uh, That's when 6 finds 1100 hiding in a tree. He says the brilliant line, I do bad things, but I have good Mm -hmm. reason. Obviously talking about his... Obviously double speaking there about his surveillance uh, job. Then there's the other scene that was, I think it was the third one, where it's an extended version of when two and six meet for the second time. And uh, two talks about how letting people know they're under surveillance is actually a good thing because it keeps them from getting paranoid over whether they are or not. It's like a Philip K. Dick moment. (laughs) Real Philip K. Dick hours. Yeah, that was the third one. Anyway, yeah, I didn't really have anything else. Obviously, there were a couple new actors in this, so. Right, yeah, I only really had the interesting kind of hallucinations connection to, to talk that I wanted to talk about. I think this was my favorite episode of the season oh, so really? far. Oh, really? is my least uh, I don't favorite. don't know why. I liked it, though. I think it does a good job of like adapting the hammer into Anvil storyline because in this episode, instead of him making two paranoid, he makes 909 really paranoid. Uh, and 909 is the one who eventually gets driven to extremes with 1112 and then he gets killed by 1112. Mm-hmm. But Edgy. It is an interesting variation on the surveillance theme that this whole season has been mm-hmm. pushing. Yeah, I like the episode. I just like the other two more. <laughs> Rip feel like I liked Hammer into Anvil more than you two. Was that the other way around? I don't remember I don't either. Remember. It was like <laughs> eight months ago. Not really. I am enjoying like six, the edginess <laughs> of this season, though. You know, I really miss the edgy mid to late 2000s era, so this is really bringing it back. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, but yeah, so like you said, we've got some actors to talk about um, that need to be cataloged, filed, and stamped. What was it? <laughs> it will not be... Uh, I will not be pushed, pushed p- stamped, briefed. Oh, I don't know. I can't remember. Cataloged, filed. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Warwick Gear, sorry, Greer plays 1955. Uh, his biggest roles were in Dread and Mandela, Long Walk to Freedom. But he was also in a movie called Cape Town, which is interesting because the tunnel scenes in this episode were filmed in Cape Town. Uh, Black Sails, a movie called Shark Attack 2, which is hilarious. Just the name. I haven't watched the movie. And that's that's all I, I got for, for Warwick. 
Mm, well, we also have Vincent Reagan playing 909. He has a massive career with over 100 different acting credits. Um, yeah, he's been in London's Burning, the TV series. Uh, I'm just going through now. Black Beauty, Invasion Earth, the TV miniseries, Eureka Street, Rebel Heart, Rescue Me, um, Empire. Let's see. The Street. I don't know what that is, but it's a TV show. Oh, he was in 300. The mm. Nativity miniseries mm-hmm. from 2010. Uh. He was in Snow White and the Huntsman. Nice. Question mark. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, Atlantis, the 2014 series. AD, the Bible continues. Great. Sounds like a lot of Bible stories. <laughs> Oh, he was in Poldark. Nice. Traces. I don't know what Traces is. Flesh and Blood. And yeah, just a lot of other stuff, too. Pretty good mix of TV and movies there. Pretty versatile guy, it seems. Wow, a lot of his photos on IMDb are from 300. I guess that's his biggest role. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, so those are the actors for the week. Okay, yeah. well, we do have a couple comments um, here on Facebook on the first episode, Arrival. Uh, we have one from Boz, who says, I only managed the first two episodes and then sacked it off. <laughs> sacked it off. Sounds vulgar. <laughs> Didn't like it. I th- I mean, yeah, I know what it means via context, but it's a Britishism, I guess. <laughs> Didn't like it. I think the main reason was the actor playing number six, lacking the charisma needed for the role. As you're watching, I'll give it another go. Another go. To which I responded that I am enjoying it, but I, I do agree that um, that Caviezel does not really have the same, you know, presence as Patrick McGowan. Who does, though? I mean, who does? Yeah, and that's the thing, is like, if, if Jim Caviezel tried to be Patrick McGowan, he would have just failed and fallen flat on his face. So he doesn't. And it's to his and the show's benefit that he doesn't. Right. I, I responded that also that I'm enjoying the mid-2000s edginess that it that it has. <laughs> and Boz goes, what is this mid-2000s you speak of? <laughs> and then he says it certainly looks good and is well-produced. <laughs> We also got a comment from Alex, who, similar to Boz, says, I remember I watched one of these episodes and was completely baffled because I didn't see the rest. And I just said, no time like the present. So Maybe he watched Anvil and was like, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. Just watching this first without any prior knowledge. <laughs> Would probably be a similar experience. You'd probably go like, you probably actually go like, well, I missed the first two, so obviously I'm not going to understand it. And then when you watch the first two, you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't understand it. Yeah. That's okay. I, I like being thrown into this weird world where, you know, you don't really understand anything and ev- not everything makes sense. Right. Because at least it's edgy. <laughs> well, I don't know if that's an at least. <laughs> You know, I don't know if know if we need to go that far. I don't know if we need to go that far. But. Well, that's it from from the social media comments. Right. Well, uh, if you would like to email us, you can reach us at the doctor dick at vegetable dot com. Questions, comments, concerns, angry rants, love letters, your thoughts on the prison of two thousand nine anvil. You can find us on YouTube at Dick at Vegetable. Find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and literally anywhere you find podcasts at Inevitable, a classic sci-fi podcast. Be sure to leave a rating if you like the show. Check us out on Facebook. Trust your doctor. Like us on Facebook. Also check us out on Twitter at TYD Podcast and follow us on Twitter. And next time, we're going to be watching Darling. But until then, the end. <laughs>